Hi there, I'm Graham Fitch and uh, this is my practice clinic, the Online Academy Practice Clinic um, October uh, branch as it were. So in this particular clinic what I do is I address questions that have been sent in in advance uh, by Online Academy subscribers. Um, and you get to have a little listen to what's going on and I can also interact with you. I'm noticing who's coming into the room. Um, I can't see everybody but Kerry, how lovely to see you. Kate, um, do let me know where you're watching from and if you'd like to press all those particular hearts and flowers and all those buttons that you find on Facebook, feel free to do that. That's always fun to see these kind of hearts flying out at me as I'm um, talking. And we've got Lynn, Simon. Uh, let me just uh, start, I think. Why don't I just start? And then people will join in as we go. So thank you. Who is that that sent off the heart there? The first question is from Peter, who asks, when learning a new piece, what is the best way of finding out the limit of my working memory so that I do not try and work on a section that's too long for my working memory? Well, that's actually a really important question because um, our working memory, or used to be known as the short-term memory, is that uh, part of our memory where we can uh, absorb information, hold, retain information. So let's say it's, it's this, this big. So if I'm practicing in a section that's too long, what tends to happen is by the time I've got, say, to here, my, my brain has forgotten what happened at the beginning. So if we really want to practice well, the idea is to work on small sections at a time and then one small section and then we string it together to the next small section. But it's impossible to answer that question scientifically because I think it would depend on uh, your own capacity for um, absorbing information. It would depend on what level you were at. If you were at a a very advanced level and you were learning a piece that was much simpler than your level then obviously the section that you could take would be longer. Um, if you're playing a piece that's dense texture um, you, the section would be smaller. It, it's not possible to say exactly but what I can do is just to show you um, something I just opened more or less at random the the Brahms uh, the, the six uh, intermezzi here, the, 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 this is from the Opus 116 set, um, written in 1892, number six, the intermezzo at the end. I just picked that because I think it, it would be a, an approachable piece for uh, an intermediate level player, but it's also a concert piece as part of the set. So, you know, if I'm going to imagine, I'm going to pretend that I don't know this piece, I do know this piece, so I'm going to pretend I don't, and I'm going to give you a few thoughts on that you know, how one might begin in terms of making sections up from this music. So let me just play the beginning of it so you know how it sounds. section. Um, that's probably, if I'm learning the notes for the first time, that's probably too much to take in in one go. However, I don't think I would look at this in, in any kind of vertical way, even though it looks like it's a bunch of chords. It looks like it's a chord stream, but on first glance, oh, sorry, on second glance, I notice that there are lines that interweave. So if I start off by taking my lower right hand line and this is an extension of the idea of separate hands. It's, I'm not really practicing separate hands but I'm practicing separate strands. So I have extracted or I'm about to extract the alto line now the soprano line that answers it. Now I'm intrigued what happens next. Uh, it goes back to the alto seems to finish the idea of a independent line we get more chordal music after that so that would be the first thing I do the second thing I do I would add to that my voice because it's a line and we have an expression on the piano teachers course UK which is if you can't sing a line you can't you haven't really heard it therefore you, you can't replay really it so 
when I sing, I become aware of the intensity of that chromatic line ascending chromatically. And what Brahms does at the top of the phrase, he turns around and falls down the other side in, in a, an arpeggio figure. Do you see how I'm also using my mind to, to discover patterns? I call this PPR, Personalised Pattern Recognition. So I notice that there's a chromatic scale going up here. Then he skips and falls down and there's an E major chord there in its first inversion, I guess. How did, now I'm fascinated to know how he answers that. Let's have a little look and see what the answer does. Repeated note, but here, there's only a chromatic dip there. It's not really a chromatic scale as there had been. But we've still got the idea of a, a chord filled in with a passing note. So then my, my attention might then go to the left hand. I might miss out the rest of the right hand and just have a look and see what's going on. Maybe I'll just look at that much so far. Well, again, rather than just mindlessly playing notes, I'm trying to find out as much information as I can from the page as I go. So I'm noticing I've got octaves. That's an interval of a fourth. So is that. So I've got two intervals of the, of the fourth, perfect fourth, that rise up. So I'm already on my way to memorising that because I've understood here what's going on, the design of the music. So then we have an ascending octave. Now I'm drawn to this bass line. That's immediately reminded me of from the beginning. So I'm making, I'm trying to make connect, well I'm not trying to, I am making connections so that it's not just my muscles that are learning the, to play the piano, it's my ear that's learning and it's my mind that's picking up patterns. So then what might I do next? Well, I might decide to put the right hand together. And if I'm struggling to balance the sound there, so to, to bring out the alto a little bit stronger than the top, I could call on a, a fantastic practice tool, which is to use two hands to create the sounds that one hand will have to make um, in order to create an ideal blueprint of the type of sound that I want. So it, it may just mean playing the left hand louder in this instance. Let's say I'm happy with that sound, I would want to work on it a bit more. Then I see if I can replicate using the one hand. There's all sorts of other things that I would do there, um, working in such a way that my sections kind of inter interlock a little bit. I wouldn't say, right, there's one section, um, I'm not looking at the rest of it. I'm trying to work in, within a paragraph and see what, what might be possible. However, it's also a very good idea to practice one, once you've got to know a piece a little bit, to, to practice one bar and one note, literally, and make sure everything is beautifully organised within that one bar. One bar plus one note, stop. Go through anything that, that doesn't feel good, sound good, or isn't correct, and, and, and make sure that you don't pass to the next bar until that first bar is absolutely, you know, your inner quality control inspector can, can sign that off. So I hope that addresses your question, Peter. There's no one answer uh, to that question. Um, trial and error, I think, with that. So Nicola has asked, hello Graham, I'm currently working on Schubert's Impromptu Opus 90 number three in G flat. I have many problems with this piece, but one which I cannot seem to resolve starts in bar 75, where the right hand plays against the trill. My problem is that my fingers are a little misshapen and my right fourth finger is very thin. I also have a bit of a problem with any stretches between the third and the fourth finger. Yes, I'm not surprised. Most people would not want to stretch between there unless you had to. Uh, playing the C double flat against, uh, do you mean, aid, uh, well, let's look at it in a second. Even playing it with my fifth and second fingers is difficult. How would you approach it? Right, well, we all know the G flat impromptu, I'm sure. <laughs> probably one of the first um, songs without words 
it's not entitled Song Without Words, but it is a song without words. How nice to see everybody joining me. Thank you for, for coming. Uh, Sue, hello. Um, so the, the bar that Nicola is asking about, bar 75, actually let me go back a bar because that I'm, otherwise I'd be starting right in the middle of the phrase. So this is bar 74. <laughs> divine music um, no wonder people love it I think it expresses the whole gamut of, of feelings and um, human emotions starting off serenely then you get the, the tragedy in the middle section you've got tragedy you've got resignation you've got acceptance you've got sections that are up it up with the angels um, and at the end it resolves itself and I think maybe this is why people request it at their funerals that they you know it, it, it brings solace while uh, 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 acknowledging that life can be and is full of pain and suffering um, but that's slightly philosophical and getting away from the the, the question that Nicola posed here so the, the the bar in question bar 75 if I play slowly right hand and it's this moment that she she is um, saying is, is giving her trouble. Now, there's several things here. It, if you wanted to reach this with five and two, you'd have to be move, moving. You can't lock the hand and play this in one position. A lot of people try, I've seen it. They, they, they think, oh, that's one hand position. Let me just fix my hand there. Even here, I'm mobile. I don't know if you can see, but there's mobility going along in my hand. Now, move. Do you see what I've done there? You could explore this, Nicola. If you started from your lap, just land in five and two and just see if your five and two can manage from a very naturally aligned position like this, rather than a potential twisting position from before. If, if you're still finding that that's, that's not comfortable or not possible, I, I have looked for alternatives, redistributions. There's no way of letting the left hand come up for that. The left hand's busy down there with its true. So you'd have to find a way of either refingering it. Now the only possibility for refingering is to put the thumb, move the thumb from the G flat to the B flat, which is obviously not going to be practical. It's going to slow you down. It's going to create a bump. So in this instance, I would say if you've tried my first suggestion of moving across and letting go of that G flat, don't hang on to that G flat on the top. You don't need to. It's in the pedal. Move and then move back. Do you see how much mobility there is here? Lateral mobility from the wrist. Um, if if that doesn't work, even even with the movement and the alignment, and your hand is genuinely too small to reach it, I I don't see any real problem missing out. And I'm not a fan of missing out notes. It's the last resort. double flat by itself without the B flat and you may ask well is that kosher well there are B flats all over the place in that uh, frankly I doubt that anybody would notice and if they did notice they would quite understand your reasoning for doing that do you see what I'm doing there how many B flats have I got in this bar loads one two three four at least are just in that beat so if you missed one of them out um, nobody's going to ask for their money back, I can assure you. Nikki, um, I always hear bells tolling in, in the last bars. Yes, absolutely. Bells tolling is great. Um, I've got here, my, one of my piano professors wrote the word bitter here. And then here's resignation. And look how the bass moves down. I feel like we need to do a, a session, a, a tutorial session, just on this one piece. But that's that's for another another occasion. So Nicola has a, a further question, which I'll answer just just quickly. Uh, Hello, Graham. I know you ha I have already submitted one question for this practice clinic, but I wondered if you would consider a second. I'm playing the Liszt transcription of Schubert Stenkin. Um, I'm really struggling to keep my left hand accompaniment soft without having ghost notes. Can you help? Well, I, I'll try. Um, I've 
didn't know exactly which spots you were thinking of there, Nicola. So I have just used my initiative and come up with something where that's marked pianissimo. I'm assuming that you don't have that issue when it's um, louder. So uh, this section here. All of these, these uh, staccato. Now, I think there's several uh, possibilities why that might be, and I, I wouldn't want to sort of diagnose without seeing you. Um, yeah, so Lynn, hi Lynn. Yes, please, a tutorial just on this piece. Yeah, okay, great, well, let's do it one time. I want to learn it, tried a few years ago and gave up. Oh, what a shame. Um, yeah, I can, I can feel a tutorial on that piece coming on. Um, let's save it though. So to get back to Nicola's question, the, the one, one thing about playing soft, I think a lot of times people think that soft is weak. Um, and equates to weakness in the hand or flimsiness in the hand. But actually, if we want to really control our sound at a pianissimo dynamic level, we've got to have fairly firm fingers. In other words, fingers that are going to support the what's going on behind it. So there's two things. One is not to have floppy fingers. Um, the second is to make sure that you're going down all the way into the key to the key bed or to the sounding point is the more modern uh, terminology for that so it's it's the spot at the bottom of the key where we got where we don't go any further so com firm fingers combined with that uh, depth of key descent should solve the problem but if if that's not immediately resolved it there's certain things that you can do in your practice that would certainly help um, now this is not anything of my own invention. This comes through the, the grand line of the, the grand tradition. Uh, and we see it in the Courteau work. We see it in the, the, the grand Russian tradition as well. What I would do, what I could do, is to play perhaps, instead of playing all three notes each time, and again, do you notice how I'm moving from one to the other? There's my hand position for this chord. There's a different position for this. I'm not trying to keep my thumb locked into the onto the G. I'm dancing between the, the two positions. I could practice, say, just the top note. How about I go back now and see if I can add my top note to my second note, the middle note. Now let me do the lowest note. in my fourth finger. Now what I could do is to play the lowest two notes. Missing off the thumb. I didn't like that because I wasn't together. There we go, that's better. How about I play the two outside notes? How about I do this? How about I play all three notes except I repeat a given note, a selected note, let's say the middle note. I go through that again repeating the pinky note or the, the, the lower note I should say the lowest note to get the idea these are some uh, various ways of practicing that will give you real security in the hand positions there so I hope that answers that question uh, Mark asks um, about the Grieg Nocturne, um, Opus 54, number four, the long right-hand trills in bars 15 to 20 and similar trills near the end of the piece. I'm having trouble making these trills sound free and bird-like, if you will. Certainly, this, this whole piece is really to do with birds, isn't it? If you think of the beginning, maybe there's an eagle perched on a branch here. And the eagle calls. A little bit more vociferous. Nikki says thank you. Great. Um, and then uh, later on here we get a real honest to goodness bird song. Bar 15. Uh, is this bar 15? Yes. I think it would be tempting to go in and look at the 
the technical issue um, cold, but I, I like to put things in context if possible. I notice here that there's a right hand that, that, that is very bird-like, isn't it? You've got a, a call there, and then it kind of morphs into the trill, uh, ever faster from duplets to triplets to the whatever it is that you decide for the trill. But you've got the middle element, very ambiguous in terms of its metrical structure because the, all of the, the, the strong beats are tied over, so you've got full of syncopations, but they're not so clear, the syncopations. Then your trill, and then the bass. So we have to wait until the third bar for the bass to fill in all the harmony. We've got that delicious ninth chord there. Um, because I think it's very, it's very possible sometimes to get fixated on a technical problem and not see the bigger picture of how it fits into the music and what the music is describing. But now to address the technical issue or the practice issue, I always feel with trills um, that they, it's clear that they've got a finite number of notes. I mean, nobody could argue with that, that there's a finite number of notes in any trill. The question is, are they organized metrically, in other words, discernibly, with a beat, so are they 16th, 16th notes, are they triplet 16th notes, or is it just, just some sort of arbitrary free, uh, free trill? Well, uh, sometimes it's one thing and another time it's another thing, but for the purposes of practicing, I think it's a very good idea to explore different rhythmical versions of a trill in order for it to be free in the final analysis. So let's say you were doing two for the price of one. I'm, I'm going to save a little time here by repeating that without the, 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 the ties, just, just to help a little bit. That's two for, two, uh, in other words, sixteenths. Now let me make triplets. Now let me make fours. Now can I make sixes? So I went from twos to threes to fours, there's, I guess you could do fives, but I was then going to sixes. Um, measuring the trill out. Now, in terms of mechanics, how I'm doing that, now I'm wondering if you can see, I'm not gonna risk moving my camera and having my whole setup collapse on the floor like it did earlier. So I'm gonna rather just show you that an octave lower. Um, it, for me, the trill would be between one and three. The pedal is obviously down for the whole of those three bars. <laughs> And the movement is a rotary movement from the forearm, which is one of the most natural movements the body can make. Just try that, just do this in the air. Um, if you want to feel how grounded the elbow needs to be, how supportive the elbow needs to be, just close the piano and do, do put, put your elbow on, on the full board here to, to feel the support. And then you can make your rotation happen here. The most natural, easiest movement in the world to make um, it only works at the piano if the wrist is, is firm, stable, um, not floppy, and it only works if the elbow is also similarly stable. So if I show you down here, you can start off by making big movements, side to side movements, and then as you get faster, and again, this is, might be something you want to do with a metronome. So I have the metronome, and then twice as fast, Aggressively getting faster, but in a very controlled way. Um, now, having gone through all those procedures, when I come to this, how fast does it need to be? I wasn't aiming for anything desperately fast. A trill does not have to be uh, especially fast. And I'm thinking back to that Schubert example. before, a trill in this register of our instrument has to be slower um, because of the, the build-up of resonance that we would get. If we played that trill fast, it would sound like a, a pneumatic drill um, digging up the street. Uh, we don't want that kind of sound. We want a distant rumble in the Schubert. 
So, but in, in this example, we, we probably want something that sounds very delicate. Maybe with a little diminuendo at the end. The next one, another bird perhaps saying, well, you think you can sing a beautiful song? I can sing a better song than you kind of idea. But again, just, just experiment with speeds uh, and don't think that a trill has to be as fast as possible. It often does not, especially in a soft context like that. Um, Tommy, I have seen many descriptions of finger staccato and these pretty much always discuss the fingers in detail, plucking type movements toward the palm. Yes, however, given that the thumb works differently, how would you best describe finger staccato as it would be implemented by the thumb? Yeah, that's a really good question, actually, because if you think about... Uh, well, let me go back over what Tommy has said before, that the idea of the, the plucked staccato, it, it's a very good thing to practice uh, leggero passages with a staccato from the tip of the finger. I'm taking the fantasy impromptu, which we just published. So that when I play at my tempo, I've got a very active uh, sense in the tips of the fingers, very light arm, and, and any other movements that might be necessary as I go up, circular movements, rotary movements, whatever they may involve. The, the tips, um, the, the point of contact between the finger and the keyboard, uh, so uh, very alive. Now, so the fingers, if you look at anatomy, uh, if you would put your your finger in a baby's hand, I did this with my young nephew, they, you know, he grabbed me by, I couldn't even get my finger out, as such is the power of that, of that grip, so, which comes from this movement. But, so the idea of the fingers coming in toward the palm, not, certainly not coming up and down like this and not going, for me, that way. I know some teachers do talk about that. I don't have any frame of reference for, for a flicking finger that way. But I certainly, uh, from my Russian training, um, would, would, would absolutely endorse this, the idea of the pluck and then the immediate release, coming back to default. The thumb, well, if you look at how the thumb works, let me see if I can get my thumb close to the camera here. Um, Mari is watching, hi Mari. Uh, you know, the thumb moves up and down like this and it moves like this. If you, if you just look at the range of the motion, it also can move in a circular way. So, but given that we, what we're effectively dealing with here is a pizzicato, You'll, you'll want the thumb to be in contact with the key. So my, my instinct there is not to do the up-down, but to do, just be very close to the, to the key and move, move very slightly on the, on the in. Um, there's no tension in that if you do it well. Uh, and and it, it really sharpens up reflexes. So yes. Rhea um, asks here, I'm starting to learn Chopin's Nocturne Opus 9, number two. I would appreciate direction on how to practice the left hand to play it properly with all the big jumps. The first four measures would be plenty to cover to give me direction. Any other comments or suggestions regarding the piece would be appreciated. I'm holding off starting until I see here your input. Oh dear, okay. That puts a little burden of responsibility onto me here, Rhea. Right, well, the very first thing I would do here is to forget the left hand and just appreciate that the right hand is a song. Um, based on the, the bel canto idea of opera that Chopin was so obsessed with, actually, through his piano writing, he wanted to make the piano sing. He wanted to make the piano not sound like a percussive instrument, but like, like a vocal uh, uh, replication of the voice. What does that involve in, in piano playing? It, well, one thing it involves is breathing. And he was a great believer in, or he taught anyway, breathing through the wrist. So when we finish our first phrase, again, notice I'm singing. I can't stop singing. So I'd release there. I don't have to release my keyboard. In other words, it's not a big movement up like that, but just breathing this way. Now there's something I did there that it is very important if we are to replicate the, the quality of a voice. And that is after a long note. Listen to what's left of the long note and match it up to the next, to the beginning of the next sound. Because if I didn't, if I did this, 
you get this whopping great accent on the F. So listen to the G. Match. And then I can come out of that afterwards. I can play the G a little bit more firmly. Then I'm back in the room here. Now there's an appoggiatura. An appoggiatura is simply a note that leans against the harmony. It's a non-harmonic tone. That F doesn't belong with the chord of E flat. So I resolve very lightly. Now, I, I can remember very, very clearly the first uh, lesson I had with Andras Schiff, who showed me the release, which is something I knew anyway, but I must have just forgotten about it, the release upwards through the wrist um, on the resolution of the appoggiatura. So, um, that, breathe. Now, so the first thing, coming back to your question, the first thing I would do would be to work a little bit on the right hand, sing it, um, feel it, see if you can figure out where the breathing places would be. Have a little look at Chopin's fingerings. There's a weird fingering in bar four. Now, whether this is the composer's fingering or whether this is Paderewski's, I'm not so sure, but whoever edited this um, uses the fifth finger twice. Which is actually a very beautiful thing to do because you don't want to hear you want to hear the port de voix, the float. If you think of how a singer would do that, I'm no singer, I'm not going to illustrate, but there would be a floating up from here, and maybe a breath. Some sort of timing, anyway, um, that, that would come from the voice. Now, you probably don't want to hear any of this. You're probably thinking, yeah, 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 but I want to, I want to know about the left hand. Well, the left hand's made up of two elements. If you look at it, there's a bass line, uh, on the first note of each beat. We've got four beats in the bar, we're in 12-8. And they're marked staccato, which is not a literal uh, note silence. It, it tells us here to give a little stress to that and actually release upwards, up, up. A little bit of an accent there on those. So I first of all get very familiar with the pinky notes. And again, notice what you notice. If you heard the, the answer, my answer to the first question, I noticed there's an interval and an octave, perfect octave. Step, a step down, there's another perfect octave, there's a fifth. Now there's something a little chromatic here, maybe a little more intensity there toward the end of the phrase, and then another octave, cadence. So that, that could be a great thing to do next. After that, I would be inclined to add my right hand to that. Use my pedal. Ah, oh, stay down, sorry. If I were practicing, I'd go back and fix that. The, the bit that I think people worry about with this piece is, is as you say, Ria, you're talking about the jumps. But before we get to the jumps, let's have a little look at the chords, the inner part, the middle level, if you will, which if you play the um, abstract without the bass, you'll discover they don't move very much at all. Here's a note that moves, the second finger. Now here I have to go up to my B flat harmony don't forget that D flat F minor and if you can label these harmonies that's a B flat 7 that's a G7 and the G7 is such an important harmony that they even named an entire conference after it and then C minor another diminished harmony see what I'm doing I'm just again I keep harping on this but I'm trying to use my brain at the same time as I'm using my fingers and my ear so the other thing I'm doing there you may not have noticed, but if I leave my pedal out, I have got a point of connection between the first chord and the second chord. I like to feel that, so I lift up my second finger, because I've got to repeat my second finger, um, and then see what I, do. I lift up my second finger, hold onto my pinky and connect my pinky to my fourth finger. Now I can do the same job here, lift up my second finger. Why lift up my second finger? Well, I have to repeat the key. I have to use that same finger again to, to replay the D. But I don't need to lift up both fingers because my pinky can join very nicely. And that keeps me super close to the keys. What it also does, 
Hi, Cheer, yes, nice to see you too. Um, what it also does is it keeps me close to the keys and it, it, it gives me very good orientation between one chord and the next. So I'm relating one chord to the next, it, but physically, by the joint. So I would practice that. And if you want a little bit of help with that, you can double tap the finger or fingers that can't join. That's a useful way to sense that. Now there will be one place, let me just see, yes, in bar two, the second beat, there's no connection there possible, so I, we, one just moves across. See the movement? Now, the, the next stage would come probably... End the phrase, breathe. But you see, what I'm doing here is I'm not practicing mechanically. I, I'm going for balance, I'm going for sound. We always need to go for sound the right hand more projected than the, than the middle middle harmonies. But these harmonies lighter, um, aerated perhaps. Uh, they've got a little bit of uh, air in them, in the sound. And this is just much more concentrated, the sound. Whereas here, lighter. So the flavor of the, of the, the two different elements, I want to try and get those flavors working. Now, the, the, when you come to put the left hand together, there's all sorts of things you can do. The first thing that you could try would be um, a technique I call quick cover, whereby I hold my first note down until such time as I'm ready to move. And when I'm ready to move, and only when I'm ready to move, I move very fast. No, I would, I'm undershot to the surface of the next keys. Yes, I'm happy with that, except my second finger, you probably can't see, is not quite cent central to the E flat. Yes, I'm happy there. Now I've got to make another cover from here back down to my pinky. And then another cover here. Was that movement fast and accurate? Yes. And another cover from here to here. So each time you've got a movement to make, uh, a jump to make, measure it. And the way we measure it, let me just repeat that so that you've got Maybe I can repeat it slightly differently. Move, but don't play. Move fast, but don't play. And what I'm aiming for with that is to check that I, I got, to what, got to the chord correctly and directly before I play it. And inhibiting the playing is one of the hardest things to do. When I'm teaching this to people, they just so want to play. They get there and they want to, want to immediately play. Get there and sit. to move now. Yes, I'm very happy with that movement. It's free and it's fast. That's step one. Step two is, is something I call um, springboarding, where I sit on the surface of the E flat down there and when I'm ready to play I jump off it and land. Do you notice when I land, I landed freely. I'm feeling that there's a spring in my wrist. I'm not actually moving my wrist, I'm just showing you that my wrist is not locked. Now I've got another springboard to make between the, the last note of each beat and the first note of the next beat. Up, down. So I'm thinking of jump, land. And if you, if you ever watch a, a cat um, falling off a wall in slow motion, you can't actually watch them live in slow motion. You have to have filmed it first. What they, what they don't do is set their paws to, you know, when they, when they jump so that they're landing like this. The body is completely free until just before they land and, and then they open their legs out and claws or whatever it is cats do. It's the same with us. We don't want to be locked in position. I find my position uh, just as I'm about to land, which means I keep completely free in my arm and my, my hand, freedom. And if I'm free in my arm and my hand, I'm, I'm mobile and, and mobile is fast. You know, if, we, if we're locked up anywhere, we can't move. It's impossible to move freely. Now, okay, uh, uh, the, so what I've shown you there is quick cover, selective landing, and I'm gonna show you one other, actually two other things. One, uh, so not selective landing, springboarding. The other one I'm gonna show you is selective land, landing. Maybe ask, Graham, if you have time, what's a quick psychological, no, physiological tip for picking up speed around the keyboard with really fast, broken, and I can't see any more. 
it says see more but I don't want to press that button I'll tell you what let me uh, let me address that after the the clinic there maybe um, right because if I press that screen I'm worried that my camera is going to topple over and fall on the floor like it did when I was setting this up earlier uh, I will I'll get back to you on that so uh, the, the yes yeah, selective landing is where we land in a selected uh, on a selected a note or pair of notes or whatever of the chord. So let's say, let's find a, a juicy three note chord, which of course I can't now that I'm looking for it. Okay, the first I'll have to do. So instead of landing in both those two, I could land in the top one first and then touch in the second one afterwards, or I could do it the other way around. And that's often a very helpful thing to practice. Now, stopping on, uh, selected notes of the beat is also helpful. If I stop on the second note, what would happen if I stopped on the third? I'd give myself a controlled stop on the last beat. I could do that also on the first. That gets me down from the last chord to the first new bass note really fast and gives me, it buys me a little moment at the, on the arrival of my pinky just to recover from that and to plan ahead. So some of you will be thinking, well that's, that, that sounds like rhythms. So you're doing slow, quick, quick, slow, quick, quick, and you're doing quick, quick, slow, quick, quick, slow, and then you're doing quick, slow, quick, quick, slow. Yes, it, it does sound like that. But the problem with thinking of, of just practicing in different rhythms, it, it engenders a kind of mechanical approach to practicing where the, the brain switches off, the ear doesn't listen, and we end up just going through the motions mechanically. But I'm, I'm, what I would rather think of that as I'm using controlled stops in order to explore landings and jumpings. Um, it ends up sounding like a, a bunch of rhythms, but that's not really what that's not really the, where it comes from. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping that gives you a, a, a sort of structured plan for practice. And the thing with all of this, oh, Michael, hi, Michael. Just Michael's popping in quickly. Yeah, nice. And then popping back out again. Um, the, the idea of the practicing like this is you'll notice that it's structured. There's not or maybe I'll just play it through and today it'll be better. There's a stepladder approach to it. It's stage one leads to stage two, leads to stage three. And then if you go back to those stages again the day after, um, it's the cumulative effect of, of taking the medication, if you will, that, that, that gives the, the product in the end. I sometimes think of uh, a course of antibiotics. If you're Taking antibiotics for an infection, you take one pill, but it doesn't. You don't notice any difference. It doesn't mean to say it's not working. You just don't notice any difference. You, that's when the course of medication starts, and then maybe after two or three days of taking religiously, however long, however often it is you're supposed to take it, then you start to notice. Ah, yeah, I'm feeling much better. I no, no longer have that pain. But then you read the bottle, and it says, uh, make sure to continue to, until you finished all the pills, because. If you were to stop just at the moment that you felt relief, uh, the infection could come back again. Now, I'm not saying there's a direct parallel with, between that and piano practice, but I often notice people do stop the practice when they start feeling the benefits of that particular practice. Often a very good idea to go back, um, carry on for a couple of days with those stages. It'll only make it better. And if you feel like, well, I can already do those stages, then do them with your eyes closed. <laughs> Practicing with one's eyes closed is a fantastic thing to do, not only do you have to feel much better but you're, you're able to hear much better too um have i finished i think that's the last yes end of slideshow i've finished uh, the questions that have come to me if you have a question that you would like to to raise in this practice clinic and we do them every month um, there is a protocol we need to know two weeks before uh, the cutoff is two weeks before and there is an application procedure uh, which is is clear and we will put a link uh, so that you can see how to do that I do need to know bar numbers if they if you've got individual specific spots in pieces. If you've got a general question about a piece, fine. But if you've got a problem, give me bar numbers. Don't say on the third page or you know the bit where the left hand does that because it might not be immediately obvious to me. 
But anyway, thank you so much, everybody, for your attention and for your audienceship, if there's such a word. Um, I've enjoyed spending this time going through these these uh, examples here, your questions and problems. And um, have a great afternoon, and I will look forward to seeing you in the clinic in November. Thanks all.